Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program, The Bengal Tiger, a part of just our Discover India series. This series is brought to you through a partnership between the India Association of Greater Boston, the Sishu Bharati School, and the Burlington Public Library, and with participation of public libraries in Acton, Andover, Marlboro, Tewksbury, and Westford. I'd like to thank the members of the India Association of Greater Boston and Rupesh Mathur, our presenter for tonight, for the generous donation of their time and knowledge to make this series happen. If you enjoy tonight's program, I would also invite you to view the previous programs in the Discover India series on our website at burlingtonpubliclibrary.org, where you will learn more about India's many cultures and wonders. It will also be putting a link to that in the chat. Tonight's program will be a presentation followed by question and answer session. In order to ask questions, please feel free to do so at any time using the Q&A feature within Zoom and your questions will be answered at the end of the program, time permitting. Joining me is Vashali Gade, president of the India Association of Greater Boston, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Nicole, for the warm welcome here. Hi, um, I'm Vishali Gade, President of India Association of Greater Boston. It is one of the oldest organization in New England area for Indian Americans to foster the social, cultural, and community presence in New England area. We also try strive to unify the diverse culture of India here in America. Um, hope you have enjoyed the series so far. Um, Today's presenter, Rupesh Mathur, you probably saw him at the episode two presenting 10 beautiful hidden places of India, taking us on a beautiful and informative journey. Rupesh Mathur lives in Salem, New Hampshire. He is a product manager by profession. He enjoys learning and teaching culture, history, and philosophy. And he's interested in the impact of technology on the real world. Uh, which has actually led him to create a 3D printing project. Um, and via this project, he has helped many uh, during the COVID by creating the mask, shields, um, and so forth. Um, Rupesh Ji also teaches Indian culture at the Shishu Bharati School um, in Nashua. Uh, so let's get ready. Let's, get, let's know more about the mightiest and the beautiful animal uh, species on the earth, the Bengal tiger. Um, after the series, we also welcome your feedback about the series that has been presented so far and any future topics that you may be interested, we would definitely would like to come back with those topics um, for our fall um, episode. Thank you, Rupesh ji, please take it away. Thank you, Vaishali ji. Uh, uh, hello, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us here. And uh, I'm going to talk about the Bengal tiger. Right, so today's topic is the Bengal tiger, which is the Indian tiger uh, at work and play. So um, I'm going to start by uh, some pop culture references. Right, so the tiger is uh, very popular in popular culture. Those of you who grew up in the, uh, the few past decades know that he's the emblem of the cereal on a cereal box. He's Tony the tiger. Right, so he's great. And then. Uh, when we were kids, we many of us read or watched the cartoons of uh, Winnie the Pooh, where one of the characters is Tigger. And uh, here's my favorite poem about tigers, right? So which is the wonderful thing about tigers is tigers are wonderful things <laughs> and so on and on. So it's a wonderful, wonderful character and brought a lot of joy to many children over the years. More philosophical character is uh, Tiger uh, is Hobbes and Calvin and Hobbes. And uh, he's, the, uh, he's basically a stuffed tiger that uh, Calvin has, but it comes to life in Calvin's imagination. So uh, I love my Calvin and Hobbes, I love Tigger. And uh, when I used to eat cereal uh, and lots of sugary cereal, I used to love Tony the Tiger too. If you go further out, uh, there's lots of characters in movies and comics uh, that are based on the tiger. So in Kung, Fu, in Kung Fu Panda, you have the tigress who's really great at you know, fighting Kung Fu. Then DC Comics has Talkie Tawny, uh, who's like an alpha male type of character. And then you have Tiger Jackson, who's, a, who's a, also a cartoon character. Then 
in the movies, um, tigers make an appearance in many places. Um, so you have the hangover, you have uh, the guy who wakes up from a hangover and then there's a tiger in his bathroom and he has no idea how he got there or the tiger got there. In The Walking Dead, uh, you have Shiva the tiger, right? And The Jungle Book, which was a um, cartoon series, that, um, which was a cartoon originally a book by Rudyard Kipling, which is set in India. Um, you have Shere Khan, who's one of the great movie villains of all times. And then a more mystical uh, tiger is Richard Parker in The Life of Pi, right? So he's uh, Richard Parker is ends up on a boat with the boy, and then the boy has to learn how to uh, survive on a boat, uh, shipwrecked boat in the middle of the ocean with a tiger for company, and he has to learn to deal with the tiger. Right, so that's I, I like that because it's kind of like a metaphor for life. You know, we are all in a lifeboat of uh, in the middle of the ocean. And then uh, more popular culture, um, you know, a tiger makes his appearance in Katy Perry's Roar, one of the big hits of a few years back. You have the Rocky Three team, Eye of the Tiger. And as soon as I hear that drum beat, I know that that's going to be an amazing song. I knew that was an amazing song. And when I lived further south in uh, Delaware, I went and saw the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art where Sylvester Stallone is you know, pounding up the steps and Eye of the Tiger song comes along. More recently, we have Tiger King, which during the pandemic became like a, almost like a required viewing for many people on Netflix. And further out, you have people like Siegfried and Roy, whose show was based on the white tiger, which is actually a, 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 an albino Bengal tiger. And then uh, one of the uh, cultural phenomenons that caused a lot of anxiety to many parents is that of the tiger mom, who's going to produce this kid who's a winner, right, by really making his life hard and making him work hard. Then you have sports teams like the LSU Tigers and the Detroit Tigers. So tigers are everywhere in uh, popular culture in the United States, and uh, they are uh, uh, used in, as motifs, as symbols, many, many places, right? And then, of course, this year, uh, we had tigers in the Super Bowl because the Cincinnati Bengals uh, basically are named after the Indian Bengal tiger, which is the topic for today, which is the tiger we're going to talk about today. But um, and that brings us to the first question in this in here uh, uh, in today's uh, session, which is the Cincinnati Bengals are named after the Indian Bengal tiger, but how did they get the name? And I have four choices for you. Choice A is the city mayor went to Bengal and was highly impressed by the tigers there. B, the Indian government gifted a couple of tigers to the city. C, Joe Burrow wrestled a tiger in elementary school. And D, the Cincinnati Zoo has a famous tiger exhibit. So let's see if you can vote and uh, tell us the answer. What do you think the answer is? A, B, C, or D? So lock in your answers, please. Give everyone five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one, and we're going to end the poll. So what's the answer? Most people said the Cincinnati Zoo has a famous tiger exhibit. 63% thought that was the answer. Amazing. You guys are so good. And that is correct because the Cincinnati Zoo does have a very famous tiger exhibit. There was a first zoo I visited when I first came to the United States and I was fascinated by how they had made it. So many zoos in the United States actually have tiger exhibits. They are super popular and many people come there. So the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden has a cat canyon and has had it for many years. And their first tiger that they got was a Indian Bengal tiger. So that's why the Cincinnati Bengals get their name. Uh, I think they still have Bengal tigers, but they are now have a Malayan tiger, which is another kind of tiger. And then if you go down to New York City in the Bronx Zoo, you have the Tiger Mountain. And the Tiger Mountain is also amazing exhibit where you can walk amongst the tigers and you can see uh, what they do. So it's, it's really amazing place there. Then other places that have a really good tiger exhibits are the San Diego Zoo, which has this tiger trail where you walk through a canyon and uh, you have a catwalk um, uh, and you can see the tigers below you and you can see what they're doing. So that is an amazing tiger trail. 
Then the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo has uh, the Siberian tiger, which is called the Amur tiger. Uh, and again, because they are at the same uh, latitude as Russia, where these tigers live, so the climate is basically the same, you can walk among the tigers and you can see them in, a, in almost a natural habitat. So the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo is, uh, is also an amazing place. Other places, Jacksonville Zoo also has Land of the Tiger. The Minnesota Zoo also has, similar to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, the climate is the same. So they also have an Amur Tiger exhibit there. So lots of really neat places where you can go and see tigers. And this is just, I'm just scratching the surface. And then in the context of the uh, Tiger King, the Netflix series about, uh, uh, about somebody who owns a sanctuary and rescue center, the United States has lots of uh, tiger sanctuaries. So there are lots of people who are fascinated by tigers. They breed tigers, they, um, uh, and they trade tigers, and then the tigers grow up and they find that, that they are dealing with this huge natural predator that's really hard to take care of. And uh, so many of the tigers are abandoned um, and they're not taken care of very well. So there's, a, there's an organization called Tigers in America that rescues those tigers from, uh, which are basically in abusive and vulnerable private environments because not everybody knows how to take care of a tiger or can spend the money to, uh, to do a really good job. And they're unscrupulous breeders. There are also wildlife traffickers. So uh, for instance, you have the uh, Humane Society in New Jersey. That's one of the places where tigers are rehabilitated. That's called the Popcorn Park Animal Refuge. So uh, I think that uh, that's a great place if anybody wants to go and check out tigers. So there are lots of tiger sanctuaries around. I think uh, in Canada, further uh, north of here, there's also one, there's a tiger safari uh, just across the border from New Hampshire and Vermont. So lots of places where you can see tiger sanctuaries. Then, um, uh, so, all right, so that's a, a basic intro to how, where you would find tigers in the United States and uh, where, and their place they have in the popular imagination. Now let's look at the animal itself. So what is a tiger? What is it made of? So tigers have been around for several million years. Uh, they uh, have, they are primarily uh, uh, inhabitants of Asia. So they're found all over Asia. And the scientific name is Panthera tigris. And they are part of the Panthera genus, which includes lions, leopards, uh, panthers, and other animals. The largest member of the cat family, the cat family is Felidae, including you know, your cat that you may have at home. They're the largest member of the cat family. And uh, over, the, over millions of years, they kind of differentiated themselves into six subspecies and three extinct subspecies. So there are uh, cat, uh, tiger subspecies that were hunted into oblivion, and there are six of them, and of which the Indian Bengal tiger is the one that is the most uh, in numbers. And uh, you also have other tigers that are available, but they are really doing badly. They're not really uh, in good numbers uh, worldwide. And so a tiger is basically an animal um, that is an apex predator. It has dark vertical stripes on orange fur with white underside. So its fur is uh, white and then its skin has these stripes um, and then everything grows on top of the stripes and the fur itself is orange. And why is the tiger orange? We'll find out in a little bit. Uh, tigers are very large animals. Uh, so, uh, and the males are generally larger than females. So a male can uh, weigh up to 700 pounds. A female can weigh up to 350 pounds, maybe a little bit more. A male is long, so up to eight to 13 feet long and a female is six to nine feet long. And a tiger measures about two and a half to four feet uh, at the shoulder. So the maximum height of the tiger is two and a half to four feet. And their historic range has been all of Asia. So they were, they were found everywhere in Asia. Um, in, and, but as Asia grew in population, they lost their habitat. And uh, now they, the range they occupy is about 93, less, uh, uh, about 7% of their original range. So there's a 93% reduction in range. And tigers are apex predators and uh, they hunt by ambushing their prey, which are, which are primarily ungulates, which is deer, boar, antelopes, and in the modern world, livestock, right? So they don't necessarily uh, hunt humans, uh, but they, they prefer um, you know, these ungulates, which are their primary prey. And in the wild, a tiger needs about 32 square miles uh, to survive. So uh, basically it means that it is pretty spread out and it's in, because it's an apex predator, uh, you know, it needs that territory to be able to sustain itself. Uh, 
Uh, tigers reproduce relatively rarely. They have one litter of two to four cubs every two years, roughly. Can have They can technically have a litter a year, but generally they have more, it's more like two years. And their behavior is that they are solitary hunters. So they uh, basically want to rule their territory, uh, except when with a partner or with cubs. One of the interesting things about tigers is that they are gentlemen and gentlewomen. They share meals with other tigers, unlike a lion uh, where, uh, you know, the lion eats first and the lionesses and cubs eat last. Um, when a tiger makes a kill, um, it shares meals with other tigers. If another tiger happens along, they, they get to eat. And if there are any cubs around, the cubs get to eat first, right? So that's one of the interesting things about tigers is that they have manners, basically. And this cat smells like buttered popcorn, right? So if you ever went to a tiger safari, how do you know that you're in the presence of a tiger? Uh, you might smell buttered popcorn, right? So that's one of the interesting things. Unfortunately, tigers are endangered species. Uh, they are on the red list of the World Wildlife Fund. Um, and uh, they are uh, actually at risk because of habitat loss, primarily habitat loss. All their old territories are now taken over by um, humans. Uh, Human-animal conflict is uh, uh, another thing. So as humans uh, uh, encroach onto the forest and uh, start using the forest for their own purposes, uh, the tigers come in contact with humans. And typically in a conflict, the tiger is the loser. That's really what happens. Even though it's a powerful animal, you know, humans are much better at hunting the tiger than uh, the tiger is at defending itself. And then the last thing is poaching. Poaching is an omnipresent threat to, and I'll talk a little bit about that in, a, um, uh, in, in the next uh, slides. So the worldwide tiger count is very small. In the wild, there are right now 3,900 tigers. More than half of them are in India. I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. In captivity, there are 8,000 tigers. So across zoos and private collections, there are 8,000 tigers, of which 1,000 of them are in the United States. A lot of them are in private hands. And uh, if you go back a century, um, there were 100,000 tigers worldwide. So there were not that many of them to begin with because they're apex predators. Uh, there were about 100,000 tigers with roughly half of them in India, actually. So India is like a huge uh, home range of the tiger. Then uh, let's take a look at the animal itself and what makes it unique and special. So the tiger uh, is basically a very, very strong animal. Almost 70% of its weight is these muscles. So it has got this massive muscles that are all interconnected. So it's all one big mass of muscles. And uh, it has very strong bones. It has very, very thick and strong bones, which are 15% of its weight. So basically about 85% of the tiger is nothing but muscle and bones. So it's muscles and sinew that enables it to run very fast. When it needs to, it can run at 30 to 40 miles per hour. It can it, and those muscles also enable it to carry a thousand to two thousand pounds. So it has got nothing on the uh, your best weightlifter has got nothing on a tiger. You know, a tiger can carry a thousand to two thousand pounds up a tree. So they can carry a you know buffalo up the tree. A uh, tiger has excellent brains. Uh, so it has the second largest brain of all carnivores, second only to the polar bear, because it needs to know every bit of its territory. If it has a large territory, it's got to know every bit of the territory and all the animals and all the plants that live there. So it has an excellent memory. So the tiger has much better memory than us humans, in fact. Um, it has a large skull with very strong jaws, and it has a straight lower jaw and a curved upper jaw and uh, that enables it to have a bite force of 1,050 pounds of uh, bone force. That's twice, that, twice of that of a lion. And if you have a dog, the dog has typically a bite force of about 200 to 300 uh, pound force. So it's about three times that of a dog, right? So it's, it's very strong bite. Um, it has a very thick and long tail. So roughly three feet or one meter long tail. And that enables it to maintain balance for abrupt turns. So it's, it's the, ta the tail is a good part of how it's able to hunt. The tiger has longer back legs compared to the front. The back legs are structured in a way that it, they act as springs that enable it to jump 18 to 20 feet. So a tiger can jump 18 to 20 feet uh, at a time if it needs to, right? So it's really, it can really go fast if it needs to. And it has uh, two, five claws on uh, each front leg, uh, including one claw that is that never comes in contact with the ground and uh, four on the back leg. So it has three to four um, 
inches long claws. So those are very long and very sharp claws. And uh, if the tiger with that muscle and the claw can generate about a 10,000 pound force um, when it swipes uh, at an animal. So it's really a, a, a tremendous predator and you don't want to be swiped at uh, by a tiger, right? So that's really important. Then uh, let's take a look at uh, the eye of the tiger, right? So there's a song as well as other body parts. So a tiger has excellent low visibility vision to hunt at dusk and dawn. So it can uh, actually hunt in the dark. It can hunt uh, at dusk uh, and dawn. That's the time at particularly tigers go on the prowl. Uh, tigers, the tiger's eyes can detect contrast very well, which is very important if you're in the forest and the jungle and you want to be able to uh, uh, differentiate your prey from the trees around it. So it has more rods than cones. So cones in your retina, detect color rods are for uh, contrast. So it can, it can easily detect contrast. It has round pupils to admit light, the maximum amount of light. And just like your, uh, your average cat, it has this layer at the back called the tapetum lucidum. Uh, that's a mirror layer that reflects light back into the eye and uh, enables it to see in low light conditions really well. A tiger has rotating ears uh, with acute hearing. It's better than humans. It, it can detect sounds at the lower end as well as the upper end much better than humans. And it has a false eye on the back. So it's, you can see the false eye on the back to deter any attackers from behind. And its whiskers also move. They are like radar domes. They move to detect the direction of the sound. So a tiger has excellent eyesight and excellent hearing. Uh, it does have uh, problems with eyesight. I'll come to that in a little bit. If you look at its teeth, it has uh, three inch long upper canines as well as lower canines. And those are uh, basically killing machines. They can kill prey by biting through the neck or through the spine actually. So it's really an effective hunter because of that. And then if you look at its tongue, uh, you see that in your cats also, by the way, it has this papillae, which are these things that stick out and they are curved backwards. And they're, and they're used to strip meat off the bone. Right? So once it makes the kill, it can very efficiently strip the meat of the bone um, of the, whatever it has killed. And it has antiseptic saliva to be able to uh, deal with whatever bacteria or germs it comes in contact with once it has killed its prey. Right? So it's really an amazing predator. I want to uh, uh, do the next uh, question, uh, which is on the eye of the tiger. The tiger has excellent vision in low light and contrast but it cannot see a specific color. Which color do you think it is? A, red, B, green, C, blue, and D, orange, right? So uh, take your pick and let's see what you come up with. All right. All right, we'll give everyone five, four, three, two, one. Lock in your answer. All right, everybody thinks it cannot see blue. Okay, so let's see the answer. And the answer is orange. Interesting thing is that in, a tiger is orange, but it cannot see orange. Tigers can see green and blue very well, and they can see a little bit of red, but they cannot see orange, which is a mix of green and red, right? So if you mix green and red, you get orange. And uh, so they, their prey, which is all these ungulates, all are di also dichromatic, and they can see blue and green, but orange is seen as green by their prey and it shades into the forest undergrowth. So a tiger doesn't know that it's orange, right? So a tiger, when it sees another tiger, sees it as green, right? So that's one of the very fascinating discoveries that scientists have made in the last past few years, that a tiger doesn't know that it's, it has orange fur, right? So that's really interesting. So uh, that's uh, a really nice answer. Now, let me uh, then move to tiger sounds, okay? How do you know when a tiger is saying hello to you? Okay. A, it snarls at you. B, it chirps at you. C, it chuffs at you. D, it roars at you. Those of you who have cats might have a clue there, actually. Okay. 
I'll lock in your answers. I will give you five, four, three, two, one. All right. Better decide. <gasps> All right, 51% uh, say that it chuffs at you, and that is correct. So it, it's called prusten or chuffing, which is a sound made by a friendly tiger to greet its friends and caretakers. And it makes other sounds like snarls, roars, moans, and hiss. So let me play a few of those. Uh, so this is the sound of a tiger saying hello. <laughs> So it makes a sound by exhaling air uh, through its nostrils. So that's the sound of the, so that's how it says, hello, I'm here kind of thing. Then of course, there it, uh, uh, let's hear the snarl. That's, the snarl is basically a, a tiger saying, um, I'm not happy to see you. Okay, it's the opposite of a, of a prusten or shuff. Uh, then you have uh, other ways of communicating. So let's listen to a tiger roar. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, so a roar is a tiger saying, this is my territory, this is my space. Anybody who wants to challenge me had better show himself. Any tiger that wants to challenge me had better show himself. And uh, we either we have a fight and we we'll see who's the boss. That's really what it's meant for. Then here, here's the hiss of the tiger. So the hiss is hiss means that it's up to serious business. Basically, it's going to attack you, right? It's the tigers that attack. Um, they either snarl or they hiss. Um, so, but they don't necessarily roar. Roar is basically uh, asserting dominance. And then tigers also moan. You know, they, they kind of are like, okay, I'm, ha I'm having a bad day or I don't like what's going on. Uh, uh, it's too hot, right? So how does a tiger, tiger complain? It moans. <laughs> yeah so that's that's the no noise of a tiger that's there's a sound of a tiger that's a tired and it's complaining about the day it's had right it's a bad day at the office for the tiger so uh, yeah so those are the sounds of the tiger then uh, i'm going to now step a little bit into uh, the topic of the day so now that you've seen what the tiger is and what it's all about I want to talk about tigers in the Indian subcontinent. So the tiger species that's in the Indian subcontinent is called, um, it's the Bengal tiger, right? So, and it's a native subspecies in the Indian subcontinent. So it's found in four countries, India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh. So these are the four countries where you would find the tiger. And um, as I mentioned earlier, in the, the, uh, this whole area had 50,000 tigers in about a century back. And then they went down to 1872 tigers. They, it, there was a census in 1972 in, uh, in India, and they found only 1,872 tigers. And that immediately put it under in, in endangered status. So what happened? So the first thing that happened is that uh, there was a tradition of tiger hunting in India uh, for many centuries, actually, that was followed by the British. But with modern firearms, you can hunt down many more tigers. So uh, on the bottom left is uh, a, 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 a Mughal miniature from the Akbar Nama, which is a book written in the uh, 16th century. So this is, a, this is showing a tiger hunt in about 1590. In the middle is Lord Reading, the Viceroy of India, who basically was a representative of the British uh, crown in India, who was ruling India uh, on a tiger hunt. So these are all the tigers that he's hunted. And typically what would happen is that uh, the, the dignitary would be put on an elephant and then they would drive the tigers into a circular stockade uh, where he could basically shoot at them. So that's the basic deal. The, the tigers would be flushed out of wherever they were uh, sitting or hiding into a circular stockade and where they would be shot down by, by uh, people like the Viceroy of India. So they, that was a lot. 
Then uh, there's also a poaching. Poaching is, uh, uh, even though nobody hunts nowadays, poaching uh, is the number one threat to tigers everywhere. So there's huge demand for skin and bones. So each skin of the tiger it sells for thousands of dollars. And then the tiger parts are used in traditional Chinese medicine or Eastern medicine. Um, and each part of the tiger has uh, some function and it's basically used there. So uh, there are many people, uh, many of the tigers in India, for instance, are which, whenever they are poached, they are, uh, the skin is sold separately and then the parts and the body of the body are sent to you know, China or to other parts of East Asia where they're used in traditional medicine. Uh, but then the number one uh, reason why we've lost so many tigers is habitat loss due to population growth. So when population grows, it takes over areas where the tiger hunted. And uh, not only does it uh, do they eliminate the tiger, but they also eliminate its prey. So when the prey um, is eliminated, tigers starve. And uh, so that way you get rid of the tigers. And there's finally human tiger conflict. So as I mentioned earlier, when tigers come in conflict with humans for whatever reason, the tiger is most often the loser, right? So it cannot defend against defend itself against many humans who want to do it harm. So tigers uh, have come down quite a bit. And uh, one of the things that happened in uh, since 1900, uh, in the 1900s was that as the population in Asia grew, so the, in 1900, the population of Asia was a bit around, um, in that region, the Indian subcontinent was about 250 to 300 million people, which was, and it was pretty spread thin. And now the population there is uh, more on the closer to about 2 billion people. Right? So India itself has a population of 1.3 to 1.4 billion people. So as the population grew, uh, there, was, there were more and more conflicts. Uh, people started going in the forest to collect forest produce like honey, fruits, nuts, firewood. And they started building villages and settlements in tiger territories that put them in direct conflict with the tiger. Uh, there was also growth of big game hunting. Right? So as you saw in the previous slide, people would come to India to hunt tigers. But if there were poor shots or the tiger escaped, then the injured tiger had no recourse but to start hunting other prey because it could not hunt its traditional prey. So the injured animals hunt humans instead, right? So that's, that's what happened. So there was a growth in um, and the number of uh, man eaters who hunted humans for to, to fill their belly, basically. And uh, there was this person called Jim Corbett, who was a forest officer in India, uh, who uh, started uh, going to various places where these man-eaters were terrifying populations and they started hunting the these man-eaters. And he hunted roughly about 12 man-eaters, about a dozen man-eater tigers um, over the years. And then he realized as he hunted these man-eaters that they were all injured animals. They had been injured by previous contact with humans. That seems to be what has happened. So he wrote a very, uh, 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 very famous book. That's a classic in, of literature in India. That's called Manitas of Kumau. Kumau is the area region which is where which is where he primarily lived, and that is like a classic. And he started by hunting this tiger, which is called the Champawat tiger. Champawat is a town in that area where the tiger uh, seemed to be most present. Uh, that is the deadliest single animal that preyed on humans more than a shark or a polar bear. It was a Champawa tiger that hunted the most humans of any animal that lived on the earth. And when uh, Jim Corbett hunted this tiger, he found out that the upper and lower canine teeth on the right side of her mouth were broken. And that was the cause of her becoming a man eater. So apparently there was a gunshot injury. Somebody had tried to hunt this tiger and then it had they had basically injured its teeth instead right and it could not feed itself it could not feed its cubs and uh, uh, and ended up uh, becoming a, a hunter of humans basically and so that brings us to the next question which is the champawa tiger so there's some really nice books on this uh, there's a book called no beasts of fears and there's a whole chapter in man eaters of kumal um, so the next question is how many human beings did the Champawa tiger kill and eat? A, 127, B, 265, C, 436, or D, 912? Pick the closest number that you think. How many people did it kill and eat? Uh, 
All right, we'll give everyone five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, the leading answer is 127. And I think people thought that 436 and 912 are not uh, uh, too, small, uh, are, uh, is improbable. So here comes the answer. It's, it killed and ate 436 human beings. So it's the deadliest. In fact, that's an undercount. They think it's, there's more. Because what happened is that it, it, it was a smart animal. Uh, tigers are smart. They have excellent memory. And what it would do is it would uh, travel between villages in that area about 10 to 20 miles and, um, and then it would basically appear, it would travel through the night to the other village. And in broad, broad daylight, it would pick uh, young women and children uh, who were outside uh, to, to, to catch, to capture basically. And in broad daylight, it, it killed very few, it killed a few men, but it was mostly young women and children, which it knew, who it knew were weaker, right? So as a result, because it did all these, it attacked in broad daylight, um, it paralyzed all travel and commerce in the region and people were terrified to step out of their house. And ultimately they called Jim Corbett and Jim Corbett went to hunt the tiger. And guess what? The tiger turned the tables. And, but for the fact that he had a gun and he could shoot at it and he managed to get a couple of shots off in time, he would have become the 437th victim of the tiger. So if you go to uh, Manitors of Kamau and you read that chapter, that's a thriller. And when I read it first in high school, I was like, wow, this guy got away by the skin of his teeth. The tiger would have made a meal of him, actually. It came very, very close to getting him, actually. So that's uh, one of the interesting things uh, that happened in the early 1900s. Lots of, there, not lots of Manitors, but many tigers which were injured in hunting and due to human conflict uh, became Manitors and they started hunting humans instead. So not a good thing to do. All right, so then we come to Project Tiger. So why is it that India has more than half of the world's tigers? Is because the Indian government made a concerted effort. So there was a census in 1972 and they got a shock when they realized how few tigers were left. So they launched this thing called Project Tiger and the Project Tiger is a concerted effort to protect and preserve tigers and their habitat um, in India, which was launched in April 1973. So the same program has been replicated in other neighboring countries, so Bangladesh and Nepal in particular. And the goal is to ensure a viable population of tigers using sanctuaries and corridors. And so they, over the years, they've, they've built, uh, they've basically designated all these areas as tiger preserves or tiger reserves with core areas which have no humans, then a buffer zone where some human activity is allowed. Because India has a huge population, we cannot truly stop people from uh, interacting with the tigers or going into the tiger territories, territories, right? So each of these tiger preserves, there are many millions of people who live around them. So the compromise is that there's a core area where nobody's allowed, and then uh, um, there is a buffer zone with human activity. So that allows the tiger to have a a peaceful area and for its prey also to have a peaceful area where with no interference. And the dedicated laws. So there's a, a there's a central law which is a Wildlife Protection Act that is that was enacted just for the tiger. And there are dedicated personnel. There are literally thousands of people who are working on preserving the tiger and they have appropriate funding. So there's, a, there's actually allocation of pretty good funding to take care of these tigers. And that allows them to have active system of monitoring patrols and tracking. So the tigers are monitored on an ongoing, on a nonstop basis. There are patrols that go out to see where they are, what's happening. And individual tigers are tracked, right? So there's, so there's like a pretty strong focus on the tiger population. Um, they also try to employ locals so as in all of this, the locals typically know the territory, they know where the tigers are, they know how, how the tiger behaves. So they employ locals in these conservation efforts. And there is also a huge focus on mediating conflicts because if you don't mediate the conflict, the tiger is the loser. So there's a lot of uh, effort that goes into compensating uh, people for example, when there's a loss of life uh, or when they lose their uh, livestock. So there's a lot of effort that goes into that. And finally, uh, the goal is to promote scientific research and tourism. Uh, so there's a lot of scientific research that goes, that's part of this Project Tiger. And there's a zonal authority that's called NTCA or National Tiger uh, Conservation Authority. Uh, 
uh, that uh, actually tracks, uh, that manages all of this. So there are zonal uh, authorities that report directly to the NTCA, and there's a direct reporting there. And, uh, and there is a minister who is in charge uh, of, the, of all of this. So, uh, so this, India has made a very, very strong concerted effort with funding and personal allocation to actually preserve the tiger. And there are lots of tiger reserves in India now, and they're growing in number, actually, so you can see that. So on the right is a map of all of these tiger reserves. And if you ever go to India, you can vis visit them because tourism is what pays for a lot of this, right? Apart from government funding, tourism is what makes it really possible. So it's been a success story. So in 1972, uh, they had uh, 1,872 tigers, as I said, and then they started with a small area uh, um, and they formed this uh, tiger reserves, there's 29 of them. In 2018, now we have uh, almost 3,000 tigers, which are 70% of the wild population with 53 tiger reserves. So roughly 15,000 square miles of core area and uh, another 12,500 square miles of buffer area. Uh, India spends uh, roughly 32 to 50, 49 million, rough, about a, a bit less than $50 million uh, on all of this. And uh, in terms of uh, tourism, it pays for itself because roughly two to five million visitors per year go to see the tiger in these tiger reserves and they make about $100 million in tourism. Revenue. So it, it pays for itself. And uh, there is an annual census that happens. There's also investigation of tiger deaths. Whenever a tiger dies, they try to figure out what happened. And uh, so, uh, uh, and in fact, now they have mobile apps, they have camera traps. Uh, this person on the left, uh, Dr. Ullas Karant, is a pioneer in using these camera traps to estimate tiger populations. And now they use DNA, they use this mobile app that's called the M-Stripes app. So if you, people who see a tiger can basically register the tiger, they can take a picture and they can upload it to the app. Or if they see a pug mark, they can upload it to the app. And then the people go out and collect DNA and so on. So there's pretty strong focus. Um, uh, interestingly, the in 2006 there was a huge hue and cry in India because they found that the tiger population population has gone down uh, because of poaching and other things that's uh, that were happening. So it was really interesting. So they've managed to uh, actually uh, do a good job of managing the tiger population to uh, keeping an eye on it and of figuring out exactly what's going on there. Right? So it's a, a success story. And here are the three key people who, uh, who played a huge role along with their colleagues uh, in preserving the tiger. So in the center is a person I want to really talk about. Uh, his name is Fateh Singh Rathod. Um, and uh, Fateji, um, who he passed away about 10 years back, was is considered the tiger guru. He started this whole thing in many ways. So he was a tiger conservationist and he was a wildlife photographer. He was a forest officer who worked on the first Project Tiger team that worked on setting up this tiger preserves. And he is kind of the architect of the tiger reserve strategy, right? So he grew up with the tiger. He has he spent his whole life in service of preserving the tiger. And uh, he's highly respected in Indian conservation circles. On the left is uh, Dr. K, uh, K. Ullas Karant. Uh, he's a conservationist, a scientist, an author. And as I said, he's a pioneer in using camera traps and tracking to estimate tiger population. So a lot of the basic science that goes into tracking the tigers was done by him and uh, people like him. On the right is Valmik Thapar, uh, who was also part of the early days of the Project Tiger. He's a naturalist, conservationist. He's also a historian. He's also a critic of the tiger conservation strategy. He's somebody who's on the inside, on the outside, and he has he, he occasionally puts in a critical view, and then he talks about how tigers are not doing well, and he points out all the blind spots. So a really, really important person there. He's the author of 14 plus books on the tigers and wildlife in India. You'll see his books at the end, and I have a, a book list there. All right, so now I'm going to talk about some of the tiger preserves. So, this, so there's 59, there's many of them, 53 at last count. And in fact, they're increasing the number of tiger preserves because they find more and more areas where their tigers are present. So first I'm going to talk about the most famous one, uh, the one that a lot of people go to visit. This is called Ranthambore National Park. That was the first tiger preserve set, up, uh, set up by Fateh Singh Ji. Um, and it, has a, it is a, uh, basically a historical area where people lived. Um, and what they did is that um, it's uh, they kind of removed people from the core area outside 
and they made pe and people actually gave up their homes so that the tiger could have an undisturbed area. So this this park has 550 square miles. It's very accessible from Delhi. So if you go to see the Taj Mahal, the Ranthambore is not far away, for instance. It has a 10th century fort. There are old temples and palaces inside the park. So people have been living there in that area for a long time. In fact, there are older, there are villages that are abandoned because the Indian government paid people and people agreed to move out so that the tiger could have all of this space to itself. And it's highly popular. People go there all the time. It gets literally, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of visitors in a year. There are many resorts around that area. Tours are easily available. So it's very, very popular resort, um, a place to go uh, uh, to see the tiger. And uh, all the tigers there have a name and a number, but some tigers are, are, have become superstars. Let, let's talk about the very first tiger, which is what I have as my cover slide. This tiger is called Machli because, or fish because it has this fish mark. So on this, on the, on, on its sides, you see this mark. Is a, these are fishes. This kind of looks like fishes. So it's called Machli, and it has other names. Uh, it's called Lady of the Lake. It's also Crocodile Killer because there was a fight with a twelve-foot-long crocodile, which it won. It it had some injuries, um, and uh, so that's why it's called Crocodile Killer. And it's the most photographed tiger in the world. It was not afraid of humans, so people could see it and photograph it. And there are many documentaries on it because people could come and take videos of it. And it's also that Machli was also called Queen of Ranthambore. And because it successfully raised nine cubs, well, those nine cubs also became successful. So almost half of the tigers in Ranthambore are her descendants. And when uh, Machli died in 2016, there was a state funeral uh, that was given to her. It's, a, it's probably the first animal in India that got a state funeral. Right? So it's really important tiger. It's a very charismatic uh, uh, being animal. Then you have Zalim. And Zalim uh, uh, means tyrant. And why was it a tyrant? Because uh, he chased forest rangers and tourist vehicles. It, tourist vehicles. So it uh, did not like being photographed or gobbed at by all these people who came from the outside and would chase them. And so they back their vehicles and leave in a hurry because of because Zalim would chase them away. And interestingly, what happened is that uh, it turned out to be uh, uh, not a tyrant because Zalim actually became a mother to two orphan cubs. And uh, the, these cubs' uh, mother had died of uh, an infection. And uh, so Zalim took over and taught them the ropes and taught them how to hunt. Right? So that was very interesting. It's the first time that anybody has observed the male tiger taking on the duty of raising two orphan cubs. So that was very, very interesting what, what it did, what, he, what Zalim did. And unfortunately, in 2020, uh, it had a fight with another tiger. Tigers are territorial beings, so it was killed in a territorial fight. Then you have Ustad, and Ustad means master. Um, and it's still alive. It's uh, it's about you know 17 years old. Uh, so Ustad is a tiger that's still alive. It's called the King of Ranthambore. And uh, Ustad is was fearless and aggressive with vehicles, but people liked it because it was uh, very majestic. It's a majestic tiger. Unfortunately, Ustad turned aggressive against humans. So many people think that because uh, Ustad was tranquilized uh, many times. Uh, because uh, to check out and to give it a medical checkup uh, by the rangers in the park that it started disliking humans and turned aggressive against humans. And unfortunately, there was a forest guard who was uh, keeping an eye on Ustad. And during the course of his duties, um, Ustad managed to ambush him and kill him. So that was the last straw. And uh, Ustad was forthwith captured and relocated to a smaller enclosure. Previously, uh, he had the run of the Ranthambore jungle. Now he's in an area which is about an acre. So it's kind of, you know, confined. it's kind of in tiger jail, as you might imagine. And there's a court case. People have filed court cases. There is a social media campaign to return Ustad back to its original range. But I, it's not going to happen because once tigers learn to hunt humans, uh, they will do it again, right? So we don't want that to uh, happen. All right, so that brings me to the next question, which is uh, tiger attacks on humans. Um, roughly how many fatal tiger attacks on the people 
uh, happen per year are report and are reported in India. A, 50, B, 100, C, 300, D, 500. Let's see what you think. All right, we'll give people five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, majority think it's about 100, second uh, is 50. Okay, so let's see the answer. So uh, roughly 50 people die of tiger attacks each year. Uh, most of them in the Sundarbans, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Many more are injured. Many people are probably several hundred people who are injured. And uh, typically these are uh, foragers in the forest, people who are going to the forest to pick fruits or collect honey or nuts or firewood. And they come in contact with the tiger and the tiger attacks them. And uh, there's also human tiger conflict when the, because the tigers don't necessarily want to stay in the tiger preserve, right? So they kind of sometimes jump the fence and go walking here and there and then um, become in contact with humans. So here are some pictures. So here's a family that's going on their motorcycle and then they see the tiger there. And then here are people who are walking down a path and then the tiger comes along, right? So they have to basically make way for the tiger. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, there are millions of people who live around these tiger preserves. Okay, so there it's so, so the number of attacks is, you know, if you look at it per capita, is pretty small. So the, so really humans are not on the list of uh, the uh, animals that a tiger wants to necessarily attack. But when it gets anxious and it gets crowded, um, it it may attack somebody. Right. So that's really what it's all about. All right, so then let me just uh, go to the next one. Um, so a few more tiger reserves. Uh, so the Nagarhol Tiger Reserve is close to Bangalore. Uh, it has 248, uh, its area is about 248 square miles. It's very accessible for Bangalore. So you can fly from here to Bangalore in 24 hours and you could be in Nagarhol and seeing a tiger in 24 hours if you wanted to. And uh, this sanctuary is really interesting because it is famous for leopards, black panthers, elephants. So lots of interesting wildlife to see. And it's highly popular because there are lots of resorts out there. There's camping resorts, you can camp out there. Um, and it's also famous for fishing. So there's lots of fishing out there. So uh, Nagarhol is very, very popular there um, in South India, it's in South India. Then in central India, you have the Pange Tiger Reserve, which is a prime tiger uh, habitat. So it's very large. It's 5,000 square miles of area. And it's very rich in terms of flora and fauna, fauna and tigers. So lots of tigers there. And it has a core area, which is made up of Indra Priyadarshini Pange National Park and Pange Mowgli Sanctuary. And uh, it has um, several hundreds of, I think, 400 to 500 tigers there. So a large number of tigers live there. And it's very popular for tourists to visit. So um, one of the interesting things that uh, I found out during my research is that they also have a legendary tigress that's called Kolarwali. And Kolarwali means the one with the radio collar. So it's also known as the queen of pinch. Um, and it just died a few months back. It just died this year. Um, and Kolarwali is uh, the mother of the most number of cubs in the world. So over the years, it had about 29 cubs, right? And it's the first tiger to be radio collared and tagged and tracked. That's why it's called Kolarwali. But it, uh, its offspring actually are one reason why the future of the tiger is bright in India. Right. So, and uh, she made national news when she passed at 16 years this year. And here's a picture of the funeral. So there was a funeral held for Kolarwali uh, in paint, right, when, when she passed. Very interesting uh, animal there. And then lastly, I want to talk about the Sundarbans National Park and Tiger Reserve. So this is a very interesting area because uh, this is where uh, the river meets the sea. So you have the Bay of Bengal, which is on the right side of India. And then there are all these mangrove forests, uh, which are in the intertidal zone uh, with lots of estuaries, lots of tidal channels, lots of islands, right? Where the, where the river uh, flows into the ocean, uh, into, the, into the Bay of Bengal. 
And this is a mangrove forest that spans India and Bangladesh. And it has 400 tigers. It has many, many tigers. These are smaller tigers. They're used to swimming. They're expert swimmers. They're used to salt water, right? And they're also very aggressive. Uh, there's a lot of tiger human conflict in that area because roughly a million people live around the park. Both India and Bangladesh have, um, that area has lots of population. And uh, they live around the park. They, they go into the uh, park to collect forest produce and they fish for crabs. And um, tigers there have no fear of humans. And in fact, humans are on the menu there. So roughly 40 to 50 human fatalities each year. And with many more attacks that are um, where people get injured uh, and they recover, right? So that's there. And uh, so if you look on the right, um, you see these fishermen, they're going out into the Sundarbans. These are basically poor people who are going to fish to make a living. And they're wearing this mask because remember the tiger is an ambush predator. So um, if they think that if they wear a mask with a, with a human and face on the back, that the tiger will get fooled by that and it won't attack the person there. And tigers are known to attack even people on boats. So it, because they're swimmers, they can go and attack people on boats there. So it's the one place where you can go on a tiger safari on a boat, but not these small boats. There are actual real boats with engines and where you're protected, right? So you do have that. And uh, the, uh, the, the fishermen or the people who live around there who go into the, uh, the mangrove forest uh, to, uh, to collect produce and so on and fish, they have a goddess. Uh, and the goddess is called Bon Bibi, that is goddess of the tiger. So anytime that uh, they go into the area where the tiger live, where the tigers live, they actually pray to this goddess and they wear these masks and they go. And they have no choice because most of them are, uh, you know, make, they need to make a living, right? So uh, that's, uh, that's the reason why they have to go. And um, uh, about 40 of them uh, die every year. Um, I think this year the count, so far this year is about 27, actually, until May. And the Sundarbans are important because they are threatened by climate change and cyclones and hurricanes. So as climate change happens, uh, this area is going to see a lot of change. There's going to see the mangroves are threatened in many places because the mangroves also need fresh water, right? So they need, uh, they are in salt water, but they also need fresh water. And there are lots of species of fish, crocodiles, sharks that live in these uh, roots. Uh, many fish spawn in these roots. So the tiger is important, but so is every all the other, so are all the other fishes and animals that live there. So this area is threatened by climate change and cyclones and hurricanes. So that's uh, one of the things that's there. Okay, so that brings me to the last uh, bit. So I'm just, I just covered about four to five of these tiger preserves. There are many more of them, there's 53 of them, and there are many interesting and use uh, uh, tiger preserves. If you look at the top 10 list, there are lots of uh, interesting places there. So I'm going to stop uh, and then I'm going to do uh, like a, a, a quick pop quiz here. Um, let's see how much attention you paid. So the first one, which tiger has raised the most cubs of all the tigers in the world? A, Zalim, B, Machli, C, Ustad, D, Kolarwali. So let's see what you remember from my presentation. All right, we'll give everyone five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, <laughs> Collar Valley wins, and that's correct, right? So, uh, so Collar Valley had 29 cubs, gave birth to and brought up 29 cubs, most of any tiger in the world. So, it's uh, really, really popular. Um, Next question, which tiger reserve provided the inspiration for the Jungle Book? A, Ranthambore, B, Sundarbans, C, Pench, or D, Nagarhole? All right, we'll give everyone five more seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Rantambore, 
Everybody thinks it's Ranthambore, followed by Sundarbans, followed by Paints and Nagar Bowls. So let's see if. We... So the answer is C, Paints. The Paints Tiger Reserve includes the Paints Mowgli Sanctuary. Uh, so in 1831, a boy was rescued from a pack of wolves in the area. And it appeared that the boy had been brought up by the pack of wolves. And that became the inspiration for the Jungle Book that was written about 50 to 60 years later by Rudyard Kipling. Right? So that's the answer there. So really good. Uh, um, and thank you for being good sports. And thank you for participating in, uh, the, uh, in, uh, in the quiz here. Um, I'm going to end with uh, a list of books. So there are lots of gorgeous books written by many of the people I mentioned in, the, in, in this uh, presentation. So uh, Ullas Karat has written a book called The Way of the Tiger. Valmik Thapar has written 14 books. So Land of the Tiger, The Ultimate Guide to the Tigers, The Secret Life of Tigers, and The Last Tiger is his critique of tiger conservation, and then uh, this Wild Tigers of Ranthambore. And uh, Ulas Karanth has written a, a book called The Science of Saving Tigers as a preeminent tiger scientist in India. And there are also some really nice books about uh, tigers in general. So Spell of the Tiger is about the man eaters of the Sundarbans, which are tigers that live in the, in the mangrove forest. Jim Corbett's Man Eaters of Como is a classic. I would strongly encourage you to read it, right? It's, it's a thriller by itself. And uh, a book on the Champawa tiger that's called No Peace of Fears. So lots of interesting books that are out there to educate yourself and to thrill. Uh, you know, if you need a thrill, you can read some of these books and get a thrill. Right? So this majestic animals. All right. So I want to give the last word to Jim Corbett, right? Who really was the first tiger conservationist. And at the entrance to Corbett National Park and Tiger Reserve in Kumau, where he was active and where he hunted these man eaters, um, there's this uh, inscription by him. Um, so there's a sign that says, with, with a quote by him, with, where he said, the tiger is a large hearted gentleman with boundless courage. And when he is exterminated, as exterminated he will be, unless public opinion rallies to his support, India will be the poorer by having lost the finest of her fauna. So this in a nutshell is why India has invested in um, preserving the tiger and um, in making it available for millions of people to enjoy and why it continues to hold um, a major presence in India and in the world, right? So uh, with that, I'm going to stop and we'll go to questions. Okay, and we do have uh, some questions. I'll start with the ones that were earliest. Mm -hmm. um, wow, there was a reduction from 100,000 to 4,000 last 122 years. Why were so many killed? And what well, happened to them? Uh, so uh, uh, they didn't necessarily uh, die because of hunting. Um, uh, a tiger needs uh, prey. And uh, as people took over the land, uh, they basically uh, hunted down the prey of the tiger. And a tiger, so basically the tiger starved, a lot of tigers starved. And uh, so they were pushed uh, further and further uh, out of their territories. And sometimes there were direct tiger-human conflict and people would essentially kill the tiger. They would put out some poison meat or something and they would kill the tiger. So, um, uh, so they were, that was another reason. And the, another reason was hunting. So people would go out and hunt the tigers. Uh, so people would, uh, so it happens in Africa, right? So people go out and hunt lions, big game hunters went out and hunted lions and there was no protection. Thank you. Um... Another question is, when you say that a male can weigh 200 to 700 pounds, mm -hmm. do certain subspecies tend to be heavier? Is that why there's such a, a large range, I believe they're asking? Uh, that's right. That's right. So I think um, the largest tiger is not necessarily the Bengal tiger. I think it's a Siberian tiger or Amur tiger. So those grow to larger sizes. Um, so there's a huge range. Uh, and the ones in the Sundarbans, which, are, which actually hunt uh, humans, uh, they are more towards 300 pounds because they spend a lot of time in the water and they're, uh, and they're swimming and so on. So they're expending a lot of energy. Uh, perfect. So um, someone is asking, how did they count the, um, the number of tigers and who counted the number of tigers in 1900? Um, you were referring to a number. So how were they keeping track of them? Oh, that's a good question. So the thing is that it's an estimate. 
right? So it's a, it's a rough estimate uh, based on extrapolation from local counts. So many, um, India at that time was, they had the uh, part of the country that was ruled by the British, but then there are lots of these small kingdoms and principalities. And the small kingdoms and principalities uh, had ways of counting them. And there was an extrapolation based on the records to 100,000 tigers. It's not exactly 100,000 tigers, it's probably on that order. So it's uh, not an exact count. Even now it's not an exact count. So we, when we say 2,967 tigers, it's not an exact count. They're missing a few hundred tigers here and there, actually. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, with the loss of habitat, how healthy is the DNA diversity of the tiger population? Are there corridors between the preserves to allow greater DNA diversity? That is an excellent question, because uh, if you look at the tiger preserves in India, they are basically separated from each other uh, for the most part by thousands of uh, thousands and sometimes hundreds of miles. So in, uh, so the, how do tigers go from one place to the other so that they get they have genetic diversity? So unfortunately, um, uh, uh, genetic diversity has taken a hit. Uh, so when they do DNA analysis of the tigers, they find that their tigers have a bottleneck, right? And uh, so they're trying to build more corridors. In fact, there's a huge private effort by people who have money to buy land uh, between a tiger reserves so that the tigers can have an uninterrupted uh, and uh, contiguous area where they can go from one tiger preserve to the other without running into human populations. So in fact, that's the, one of the hot topics in tiger conservation uh, circles in India. Thank you. Um, someone is asking, how rare are the white tigers? Uh, they're extremely rare. They're found only in certain areas in central India. Um, it's, it's basically a genetic mutation. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the tiger has orange fur because its prey sees it as green. So it, uh, it's hard to stand out against trees. So white tiger can be seen easily by prey. Right, so it's so so there are very few of them. They don't usually survive uh, that much in the wild. Uh, someone is asking, how old is Ustad? Um, Ustad is uh, uh, he was born in two thousand five, so that makes him seventeen years old. And uh, tigers live to roughly about twenty. Um, I think the maximum age by which a tiger to which a tiger lives is about twenty five years. Um, and someone's wondering, um, what does tourism look like now during the pandemic? Um, I'm guessing they're referring specifically to India. That's true. Uh, so uh, interestingly, I was reading an article about the effect of pandemic on tigers. So tigers were happy, actually, because uh, uh, one of the things they found out um, by measuring the level of stress hormones in their scat, right? So when they when they when they poop, uh, the stress so the, the the poop contains hormones. So they when they look at stress hormones, they find that the stress hormone level goes up during peak tourist season. And there are lots of tourists. The stress the tigers get stressed, physiological stress, physiologically stressed. Because I think they're smart enough to know not to attack the humans, but they're getting irritated by all these people coming close to them with cameras. And the tigers were happy and the tigers actually did very well. Uh, their numbers increased during the pandemic, very likely. Uh, but on the other hand, because the revenue dropped, to, so, uh, basically tourists pay for tiger preservation, um, uh, there was a huge revenue shortfall and they had a tough time paying for uh, the salaries of all the people taking care of the tigers. Thank you. And we have one last question. Um, someone is saying that they mm -hmm. um, find zoos depressing <laughs> and they're wondering if there's anywhere in the United States where tigers are protected, but they can roam. Uh, there, are lots really? of, uh, uh, there are lots of interesting places. Um, I think uh, I mentioned in Canada, there's the park zoo, um, I think where tigers and lions roam freely. Um, the, uh, so in, in the zoos in the United States, certain zoos have excellent exhibits. I mentioned the Shane Mountain Zoo, where tigers are in a natural environment, the San Diego Zoo, uh, where they try to preserve the, the natural environment as much as possible, right? So, 
uh, zoos, some of the zoos have excellent exhibits. And um, I would, I loved going to the Cincinnati Zoo uh, to see the tigers there. And I think that uh, uh, I won't necessarily discount zoos. So it's all about where, how they are kept, right? So uh, I should mention my personal experience. I went to Las Vegas and in the back of the MGM Grand, there is a tiger uh, exhibit. And there are four tigers uh, which are crammed into a very small space and they're not happy. You can see them. You can see that they're not happy, right? So that's not, uh, I would find it depressing too, right? And uh, for a large animal like that to be, um, you know, confined in a small space. But certain zoos have done an excellent job and certain sanctuaries also have done an excellent job of, uh, uh, you know, taking care of their tigers. Thank you. We did have one other question come in saying, um, what is the main reason that tigers became endangered? Um, I, I would say the number one reason is habitat loss. Um, uh, because a tiger is a large animal, it needs to eat and uh, it has its prey. So when, it, when the habitat is lost, the prey of the tiger are also lost, right? So they, and so the tigers essentially starve. So habitat loss is n number one and, uh, and uh, due to you know, human population growth. All right, sorry, they, they keep coming in as you answer, which is great. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and someone said, can you please spell the name of that zoo in Canada where the tigers roam freely? Oh, uh, okay, I should look it up. I think it's called the Park Zoo. Um, I can, uh, after the presentation, I can quickly, uh, uh, you know, maybe uh, put in a link in the chat. If, if okay. Yeah. And, um, that's all that we have on my screen. If anyone wants to quickly type one last thing, um, I'll give anyone a minute to put that in the chat. But we, we may have answered everyone's questions. <laughs> okay. I would like to thank everyone uh, for attending this and any other of the Discover India series that you saw. And again, if you missed them, they are all available on our uh, website. Or if you missed the beginning of this one, this one will be available as well shortly. Um, do give it a couple of days. <laughs> thank you for being a great audience and thank you for your participation and enthusiasm. All right. Uh, Oh, and someone did uh, specifically say, so I will just put it in the chat. Uh, somebody answered saying for Quebec, it's Park Safari, but That's it is right. with a C. Um, yes, Park is so, That's right. That's right. Um, I just put that in there as well if, for whoever was, was looking for it. Again, thank you so much for attending, everyone. Uh, certainly keep an eye out for any future uh, events. Uh, India related or otherwise. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.